reading this morning is from Mary Luti, writer, teacher, and preacher. I get spam, you get spam, we all get spam. Unsolicited ads, trumpeting fat blockers, colon flushers, stock tips too good to be true. I've stationed four squadrons of spam blocking dragons at my e-gates, but the stuff still gets through. Recently, I was informed that a beautiful Russian woman was still waiting to meet me. <laughs> still? Gosh, just how long has poor Svetlana been out there pining? <laughs> and then there's a persistent person named Octavia Presley who spams me daily with an offer of pills to enlarge a body part I don't possess. <laughs> and that prince in Nigeria who will make me rich if I send him my credit card information. The people who are out to make a fast buck in cyberspace regard me as the most pathetic of human beings. They look at my life and weep. My hair could be thicker. My colon could be cleaner. My bank account could be fatter. My body could be thinner. My girlfriend could be Russian. What isn't wrong with me? Everything isn't wrong with me or with you either. We aren't in need of improvement. Not in things that count anyway. Don't you know, we're who the holy was thinking about while fashioning moons and suns and swirling stars. Crowned with glory we are. Processions of angels go ahead of us crying, make way for the image of God. Take that spammers. Believe that, everyone. Here is our world, friends, after another week. The beautiful music happens. The tough things happen, too. Let us keep our hearts tender and our eyes soft and our ears open and our voices singing. This is what we are about. We know there is no answer but to just love each other as best we can. And we bear witness against unnecessary destruction of which there is so much in the world. And then we gather in community to practice being the person that we look in the mirror and we say, I want to be the best person that I can. We cannot do everything. Gosh, especially after a week, if you have kids at home, <laughs> but we can do something and that something is never nothing so let us forget our perfect offering there is a crack in everything say with me that is how the light gets in I think it was Meister Eckhart who, who said something about if the only prayer you ever say is thank you it will be enough now that might be worth debating some other time but, but for now, it is really, it's really all I want to say to you. Thank you for the, the countless emails and the deliveries of trays of lasagna and prayers and bags of groceries and ingredients for hot fudge sundaes and frozen pots of youth group made lentil soup, all given us after Emerson our son returned home from eight very scary days uh, in the hospital from pneumonia. And now, many of you have asked me, so I'm just going to say it now, so I don't have to say it 200 times. He's recovering at home. He's eating it all. No matter the order or the mixing. Lentil soup after ice cream sundaes, after pasta, after cereal, after crackers and cheese. Why not? They call it comfort food for a reason. Comfort for the body that, in his case, lost, I think, 14 pounds in a week. Comfort for the soul that reckons, as we all do, with the vulnerability of this beautiful, fragile, and often resilient body that we all have. Comfort for the parents whose 
heart beats not just in our chests, but also in the bodies of our kids, which is why they say love is a holy and fearful thing. Holy and fearful to love what death can touch. And this, this goes not just for parents. It, it goes for all of us, because all of us love someone. Whether it, you shout it, whether you murmur it, whether you chant it, or even if you just whisper it. So thank you for loving us through this terrible time that we had. A time that we actually learned was more harrowing than I think that we realized in the moment of all the adrenaline. Here we say that if it's your, one of your first few times here in this church, we say here that spirituality is what we do in private. That's what we do alone. But religion is what we do in public with and for each other. And, and you showed me, you showed my family, again, just how much of our religion is love. Now, I've lived with myself long enough to know that I am what they call in the world of parish ministry a confessional preacher. You're like, uh-oh, what's going to happen next? <laughs> Now, it, that's not my only way, but it is very often my way. And what that means in this instance is that I am wearing my heart on my stole. I wonder if you can see it. Can you see it? And what my heart confesses this morning is that I have no idea what kind of soul-searing pain it is to lose a child. something that some of you I know in this congregation have experienced. But this month I glimpsed it. And it has been, there are no other words, heart-rending and terrifying and vulnerable. It makes me want to run a running hug for those that were here a couple weeks ago and heard my sermon to those of you who have, and just to, just to hold you there, to hold us there, because what else is there to do? And this time has also made me return in a very weird way, I think maybe because when you are traumatized, you go back to what you know. You ever experienced that in your life? You go back, and I went back to the stories of my childhood as an altar boy, 6 a.m. Mass every week in the Catholic Church. And I remembered this week, it came from, from out of nowhere, the story of the prodigal son. Uh, this morning I'm going to call it the prodigal daughter because the Bible needs and deserves some gender inclusivity. Now, even though many of us don't read the Bible to put ourselves to sleep, I don't do that. We, re we might remember it, but I'm going to give it a little bit of updating so you might connect. This is about the mom who had two daughters. The younger one asked her mom for her share of the property. I think it was like a restaurant or something. And then a couple days later, the daughter buys a first-class airline ticket out of, say, Worcester, and went straight out west to the bright lights and big promises of, let's say, Vegas. And though initially for the first year or two, she did really well, and she won just enough to think that she could, she could, uh, lick this thing and beat the house. Over time, she lost a little, and then she bet a little more to cover her debt, and then she lost a little more, and then she put a more down, and she lost yet a little more to cover her losses. And with all of that, her remaining share of the property began to get smaller and smaller and smaller. 
such that she knew she needed to try something different. So she bought a first class ticket, this time a bus ticket, over to LA, where she knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who said that if she hustled selling, let's say, maps to the stars, she could hit it big. But she didn't. And soon she was out of money. And before she knew it, she was on the street. And she was asking for money to find and get her next meal. And it was then that she remembered her family back home. And she remembered her mom and how she had all kinds of folks working for the business and how none of them were doing what she was doing, which was begging for money on the street for food. And the daughter said to herself, you know, I'm going to get up out of here. I'm going to tell my mom that I have failed her and that I don't even deserve to be called her daughter anymore just to treat me like a member of the staff. So then she set off this daughter on a no frills, totally no frills, maybe like Feng Hua bus ticket <laughs> that stopped at every Waffle House because they had to go down south because it was in the winter time. And then it went all the way up back to Massachusetts, this bus did. But even though this daughter was still far off, so let's say she was in Connecticut or let's say she was in Rhode Island, the mom saw that she was coming closer. How did she know that? Well, they both had smartphones. <laughs> and the mom used find my location to always keep track of her daughter. Every day, this mom did this over the years. That little blue dot. All the way, Vegas, LA, all the way back, that little blue dot. The mom, every morning, sending her a text text that she didn't answer, the mom looking at those three little dots when you send a text and you're waiting for someone to respond. You know what I'm talking about? Hoping, waiting. But now the mom has seen over the last few weeks, this, <laughs> this like week, it took like a week and a half, this blue dot moving back across the country, down south and then up north. So that when the bus pulled into the Worcester station, the mom was waiting there. And when the bus doors opened, the mom ran up the stairs all the way down to the back of the bus into the arms of her daughter, and she kissed her, kissed her cheeks, and she stroked her hair. And she brought her head down to her chest the way that the mom had when her daughter was a baby. And the daughter tried to say to her mom, I have, I have failed you. I'm not your daughter, just, and then the mom interrupted her and said, shh, my angel, my darling, my baby. Stop talking, you're coming home. Shh. I'm going to make you the calzones you love. I'm going to throw you a big party, and everyone will come. You tell me, I sometimes tell myself the Bible has nothing to say to me. Anyway, they get home, and they began to celebrate, and the calzones were piping hot, and the music was kicking, and everyone was thrilled to have the daughter home, except, who do we think? Ah, yes, the responsible one. I am an oldest sibling. 
the one who never left for the big lights and the bright promises of somewhere else, though I did, the one who stayed put and helped with the family business, the one who all these years has nurtured a beloved resentment for what she has not done And who then, when her mom came into the kitchen to get some more sauce for those calzones, the daughter complained bitterly about how unfair this was to her mother, having a big party and a big woo-hoo for the sister who took off and who basically abandoned them. And then the mom, in a duct tape moment, taking the daughter's face into her hands, and saying, baby, what is mine is yours. All that I have is yours. But we have to celebrate because this sister of yours was dead. And now she has come back to life. She was lost and now she is found. I have never given up hope that she would come home. I have never stopped loving her. She was lost and now she is found. She was dead, but now she has life. Now, when I was a kid, as an altar boy, the oldest sibling, I always listened to that story and thought about the, the siblings. I always took the oldest sibling's side. But this week, I started thinking about the story again. And I'm thinking about the mom. Thinking about the parent who has worried about losing a child and who desperately hopes and prays for a safe return and who rejoices when she does, he does, no matter what, no matter the risk that loving costs, no matter how fearful it is to love, no matter how vulnerable it makes us to love someone, no matter how fragile our bodies. I'm thinking about what it's like to go on loving other children other people when the unimaginable has happened, as I know some of you have. Thinking about what it means to go on in your life wearing the heart outside of your body. Do you know what prodigal means? I learned just yesterday that it means wasteful extravagance. Hmm. Loving beyond our fear of loss feels like that to me. Loving despite the fact of death feels like that to me. Loving despite the risks despite the fact that bodies get sick and get old and get wrinkly and gray and go in the hospital even though they work out a ton and are 18, feels like that to me. Wasteful extravagance. Friends, you and I, when fear comes, and when loss comes and when disappointment comes, and they will come, they have come, they do come. We have a couple of choices before us. I think actually it's only two. We can play it safe. We can get protected. We can forget about the daughter on the left coast. We can give our energy only to what we know will work out just fine. We can 
give love only to those who we think deserve it, because plenty of people do not. We can take our heart that's out on our stoles and our sleeves and our vests and we can put it inside and we can put big, big walls there so we don't get hurt. That's a choice. I do not begrudge you that choice. But it is a choice. Because the other thing that we can do, that I want to do, when I want to practice becoming the person I say I want to be, is to love wastefully and unconditionally and extravagantly despite the risk. God, it's hard. It's terrifying. To love wastefully and extravagantly beyond this fear that that I can't and you can't protect our children, our partners, ourselves, from all the threats. And maybe I can choose to love wastefully and extravagantly in this world that, that you and I live in, this, the, all the politics and the news and the... It just makes me want to be home and stay home and put my head under the covers. I don't want to be that person. I want to love wastefully and extravagantly and unconditionally this life that breaks my heart open. I want to be able to say to Emerson and to you, And to all of us, what the mom said to her daughter, holding her hands and around her cheeks and saying, all that is mine is yours. What is lost is found. What is dead is now alive. And now you know why I say these words every Sunday when I'm up here in the pulpit. Because this is the world. It's, there's no other world, I don't believe. This is the world right here. Here is the world. Beautiful things happen. Oh my God, terrible things and terrifying things happen. Oh my God. And I plead with myself and I plead with you to keep our hearts tender and on our sleeve right and to keep our eyes soft and our ears open because this is what I am trying to be about and I invite you to come with me we know there is no answer but to love each other I can't preach anymore Let's sing together, my friends.